Judging yourself, I think that's a tough subject. We like judging others, we like assessing others. We don't mind being in an interviewing panel to interview someone who has applied for a job, but us going through the same, we find it very difficult to be the one sitting on the hot seat with people throwing questions at you, and sometimes you start sweating, sometimes you get all kinds of stress because of it. But uh, here in Romans chapter 2, the Jews are being asked to assess themselves. And obviously many of the people Paul is writing to are Christians. Maybe the message to them is they should judge themselves. Don't wait to be judged on the judgment seat of Christ. Don't wait to be judged by the people around you. Don't wait to be judged by your bishop. Don't wait to be judged by your pastor. Why don't you judge yourself? Why don't you assess yourself and act on the result of your assessment? In which case, you don't even be afraid of other people judging you because you know yourself and you trust yourself and know who you really are. It does not bother you when somebody speaks negatively about you because you know who you are. You know, one of the dangerous things is to depend on what, how people define you. Ah, you, you can never be a singer. It's good to listen to people, but it's also important to evaluate yourself. Ah, you know you are not beautiful. Mm. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's the person talking. What do you think? Look at yourself in the mirror. What do you think? And it matters what you think about yourself. Do you think God made a mistake in making you the way you are? Really, it's important to learn to judge yourself. And the Jews are being asked, you know, before pointing fingers at Gentiles and the things they have done wrong, start by looking at your own life. Just look at uh, Romans chapter 2 verse, from verse 17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what superior, uh, of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teaches others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the gentiles because of you. Verse 25. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you have not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. Verse 28. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly. No, is a composition merely outward and physical. No, no. A person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is a composition of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person, person's praise, is not from other people but from God. What a 
a message. The message is encouraging the Jew, and I want to replace you with the Christian, to actually be people who assess themselves, who test themselves, who look at their own life. First of all, when you assess yourself, like when you do a SWOT analysis, look at the strength, you look at the, you look at the weaknesses, you look at the opportunity, you look at the threat. In the same way, the Jews are being asked to look at the advantages they have. And they have many, many advantages which they are being asked to look, to look at. They are being told, appreciate that you, compared with the non-Christians, have many advantages. Number one, you have the word, you have the law. Isn't that what he's saying in verse 17? Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law about and boast in God. Yeah, they have the law. Similarly, you have God's word. You are able to read. In fact, maybe you do, you do Bible reading family altar every night. Surely that's an advantage. The Gentile, the non-Christian, does not have the word. So he doesn't know, although he may try to please God, he doesn't even know what God wants. And you're being told, don't you understand that's an advantage you have? What do you do with that advantage? Now that you know God's word, what do you do with it? Or differently, now that you have the Bible, do you even read it? And if you read it, do you believe it? And if you believe it, do you act on it? That's really what your assessment should be helping you to, to see. So the first advantage you have is having God's word. But I think you also have a, a relationship to God as God's child. And you, verse 17 is saying you actually even boast about it. If you're able to pray, don't you think the advantage another person is going through the same stressors as you? And they're just struggling on their own. No wonder they're ending up in depression, in burnout, some even committing suicide. Because they have nowhere to download the many challenges that are stressing on them. But you have. But what are you doing with that advantage? of knowing that God listens to you, that God can hear you. Do you continue struggling with your problems without telling God? Do you carry your problems? Yet the word of God says, cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He'll take them up. That's what he's saying in Philippians chapter 4. Don't be anxious. It's not that, that, that things that cause anxiety will not come. But don't be anxious. Why? Instead of taking, making it your concern become the cause of anxiety, make them into a prayer request to God. What will be the result? The peace of God that passes all understanding. <laughs> Despite all the stressors and the issues you have, will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You will be at peace. Peace beyond understanding. Then verse 18, the list goes on in this assessment. If you know his will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law, hey, what an advantage we have. You know God's will. You know what God wants you to do. Do you even have a calling? You know what he wants, what he wants you to accomplish in life. Where other people are grouping in the darkness, trying that, trying the other. This doesn't bring joy, that doesn't bring joy. They really are just grouping in the dark. But you, you already know you are calling. But if you do, what are you doing about it? Are you living a life that is consistent with your calling? Are you living a life that is consistent with God's will? If you know it. Like verse 18 is saying. And I think that's something very important for us to, 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 to think about. Can you imagine? You know God's will. Number one. And I think that's important. That's important to know it. 
But I think the second thing is, you not only know it, you approve it. In other words, you are happy with the God's will. You approve it. That's what verse 18 is saying. And you approve it because it's superior. Because it's instructed and it's in writing from God's word. It's in, superior to anything you can think of. What an advantage you have. You know what God wants with your life. You know God's will. But what are you doing with it? Then in verse 19 we read, If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light in those who are in the dark, that's what you are. What an advantage. Because of these things God has given you above, you now not only know God's will, you are a guide to others. Whether you come about to those who are blind and in the darkness of life, you that knows the direction should be their guide. That's what the 19 is saying. If you, if you are convinced you are a guide to the blind, who are the blind people around you? Hmm? People ending up in sexual sin, people destroying their lives through immorality, some try destroying their lives through drugs, all kinds of confusion. But you, you know the right thing. You know the consequences of what they are doing. Are you really leading these people who are blind and messing themselves up? Are you leading them to the light? But he also says that you are a light to those who are in the dark. Are you? How are you a light to those in the dark? Do you ever mix with the non-Christians? Do you ever organize ways that your non-Christian friends can see the light of Christ? How then would you be a light to those in the dark if you never mix with them? You never show yourself to them. That's why you are assessing yourself, seeing the advantages and what you are doing with those advantages. You have a light, but are you using it to put to remove darkness from others? That will be quite an important issue. Then in verse 20, we, we read that because of what we have seen you are, you are an instructor to the foolish. Do you look down on, on people who don't know? Or do you try to remove their ignorance? I think that's a good thing to ask. What do you do with the foolish? I don't, me, I don't deal with that people. They are below my dignity. No, 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 no. If you have assessed that you know something and God has therefore made you not just a guide, but an instructor to the foolish. It means you don't ignore the foolish. They don't even know they are foolish. Foolish people don't know they are foolish. It's you that God has given wisdom that will help them to know where they are. It's not a good place. But what are you doing about it? Are you really an instructor to the foolish? But there's another thing that you, you have become, a teacher of little children. In other words, because of the advantages God has given you, he also appointed you to as a custodian of the next generation. You are helping to teach them, to tell them things that will help them to have a better life than the parents have had. But are you really bothered about the young people? Are you bothered about the children? Then how, how are you using the advantage God has given you? Do you realize that because of what God has given you, people may be willing to listen to you, but what are you doing with that ability to talk to people? Because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge of truth, of knowledge and truth. In other words, one other thing you have in the law is the embodiment of knowledge, the embodiment of truth. That's an advantage. But what are you doing about it? Of course, it's quite good when you see people who take what God, the version God has given them, and they make things better for people. 
when you see the YMCA or YWCA, just check their history and you see somebody who saw the need of young people who are coming to town and became a light to them. When you see scripture union, you see people who saw the struggles to know God's word and it became a light that hundreds years, more than hundred years later, is still playing a role in people's lives. What about you? With all these advantages, what difference are you making in your community, in your church, in your business? You are learning that you are an instructor to the foolish. You are a teacher of little children, therefore you are affecting the future, the next generation, because you have the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. That's something you have to ask yourself. Is that really something you are doing? Do you see these advantages? Do you actually have those advantages? A teacher to the people who don't know, the foolish, the children. Is that what you are? So, so the first task of the, the Jews are being advised is to appreciate the advantages they have and ask themselves what they are doing with it. Step number two is to acknowledge that they have breached there is their responsibility. They have not used the advantage the way it should have been used. Look at verse 21. You then, who teach others, you have just said you have an advantage, so you, you are supposed to be sharing. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Ah, what a tough question they have to, they have to look at. And it, it goes on to 22. You who say that people should... Uh, not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who are poor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So I think it's something. So the second step is an acknowledgement. Admit something is wrong. And that you have no excuse. You are not living a right life and you have literally no excuse. The more you say, oh, but you know, I'm human, you know. No, no, no. In the, sec in the, in the second step, we are being asked, just acknowledge there's something wrong with you. There's no way you can be teaching a law than breaking it yourself. Your actions... Once you claim you are a Christian, must be Christian. And I think that will be something very, very, very impo important. You know, bring God's name into shame is a terrible thing. But that's what you do. When you claim to be a Christian, you even give a testimony. You even sometimes are the person leading the service, you are in worship. The evil people also be judged, but you that has claimed the fact that you claim to be a Christian. I hear, see, I thought that guy claimed to be a Christian. How can he do that? Verse 25 is telling you, you God's name is blasphemed among the non Christians, the Gentiles, because of Christians, because of Jews who claim to have God's word, who even teach God's word and then do the opposite what they are saying. So you can see, Paul wants us to know that God is unhappy with our lives. When he has made information available, we have it and even teach others, but we are living a different life from what we claim. That does not mean you stop teaching. That does not mean you stop instructing. That does not mean you stop giving your testimony. But it means you stop sinning. You live according to the testimony you have been giving, you have been giving people, and I think that's a that's a very very important thing you need to have at the back of your mind. Verse twenty five is a real condemnation. Verse twenty four, 
God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Hmm? You teach others? Why can't you teach yourself? You preach against stealing? How can you steal and you have just been saying how wrong it is? You say people should uh, not come out adultery? And what are you doing with that concubine? Or with that sponsor, whatever name you want to give your side program. And yet you are already married. Or you are not married, pretend to be single, and yet you enjoy sex outside marriage. And yet you claim to be single. And you are teaching people about righteousness. Wow. You are poor idols. You even don't, you really think people are strange. How can they pray to cows? How can they, how can they do such things? What foolishness is this? You, you know the real God. You do not worship idols. But you even are doing wrong things in the church. Here the word uses the rope temples. So you are just left with a boast about how much you know the law. But you accurately dishonor God because you break the same law you claim to defend. So the first thing is, uh, do an assessment of yourself. The second one is, is admit there is something wrong and change. Please notice in step number three, is to assess what gives you that the circumcision. A Jew was only known to be a Jew was only known to be a Jew if he was circumcised. So circumcision is the is the the requirement, the prequalification to being a, a Jew. Similarly, in the New Testament, we become when we become Christians, we are baptized. These are good things. But unfortunately, the word of God is telling us this circumcision, this baptism has no value if you are not living right. It's not enough that you are circumcised. You are not, circumcised, yes, that means you know God's word. That means circumcision is a commitment to follow God. But are you? Baptism is a sign that you have surrendered. You have died with Christ and risen up with him. You are living his life. But are you? You know, verse 25 is telling us circumcision is not is it's not really a sign of change if nothing happened within. Similar to baptism. If baptism is supposed to confirm that something has changed within, if it has not changed, then you just move from this side being a dry sinner through the waters of baptism, you become a wet sinner. All has changed its temperature. You are still a sinner if nothing has changed from within. And the same thing in circumcision. If you are not committed to living to honor Jehovah, even if you are circumcised and now you are accepted among the Jews, you will still be not pleasing to the Lord. Then verse 26 is saying, even sinners, look at, so then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be guided, regarded as though they were circumcised? You know, there are some people who are not yet Christians are living better life than people who claim to be Christians. Then verse 27, then who is not circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. So what that means is that when God will be judging, he will not throw away a person like the thief on the cross who, although a thief and condemned on the cross, he cried to Jesus. And Christ said, don't worry. Today you will be with me in paradise. Other people, we guess, this one we are sure went to heaven. But the guy never got baptized. Because baptism is not what saves. It's a confirmation that you are saved. So that guy was prayed to the cross. And because he died there, he couldn't, you could not... Uh, bury a dead. You could not uh, baptize a dead body. So similarly, you need to understand that your baptism, your circumcision is of no use if nothing has changed from within so that you are living a different 
a different life. Look at verse 28. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. <laughs> a Christian is not a, a Christian just because of baptism and or confirmation. No is circumcision merely outward and physical. Baptism is not just appearing in the water. There's something that's supposed to be have happened within your heart. And I think that's, that will be something that is important. So what are we learning? That you need to evaluate your life. And that is, the, that is in part one. Number two, you need to admit that you are not living that life. Number three, you need to understand that the baptism is not a proof you are a Christian. If you are not a Christian. It is you, whether you are living a righteous life. And that does not mean you don't get baptized. Baptism is a requirement of the scriptures. If you are born again, you must be baptized. So, I think what then we're learning out of this passage is you should not use the law, the Bible, the baptism, to identify escape routes. You know, to say, ah, I'm okay. I don't know who baptized me. I was baptized by the bishop. No, no, no. Don't use baptism as an escape. If you know you are not living right, don't use the fact that you are baptized, the fact that you are a leader in the church, the fact that you have done that or the other for the church should not be an escape route. Go to God in repentance. No, the letter of the law is not enough, is what we are learning in verse 28 and 29. The spirit of the law is what counts. For example, if you look at a woman last free, the law will say you are not guilty because you haven't committed adultery. Jesus says, what matters is in the heart? Did you think of committing adultery? Then you are as good as guilty. Because it's not the letter of the law. It's the spirit of the law. Inward condition may be it's, it's certainly more important than outward sign, although both matter. So, the relationship should be the motivation of right living. What relationship? The relationship between you and God should be your motivation. In other words, you are not acting for everybody. You are acting for the, you are acting for the congregation of one. Your life should be lived to honor God. And if you live to honor God, it will be a blessing to the people you are with. Because the thing he has to do, he has asked you to do are good for the people you are neighbors with. But your you general intention should be the, to please the God who sees in secret. How do you relate with him? Your interest should be to please your father in heaven. To please God. Let me read verse 29 again. He is saying, A person is a Jew who is one inwardly. A circumcision is circumcision of the heart. It's a heart matter. By the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people but from God. In other words, really, if you are living a righteous life, people may not even think you are great. People may not even bother with you. People may not even think as highly of you as they think of some people who act uh, their Christianity in public. But the Lord who knows the truth about you, the verse, the verse is saying, he will be the one to praise you. If you really are walking with the Lord, your praise will not be from people. Your praise will be from God himself. And that's the thing is what he is saying. Evaluate yourself against the light of God. And if God says there's something wrong, repent. Do not think you are okay because people think you are famous and think what a blessing you are. What does God think?
is what really will matter. Your praise should come from God.